This is AMTV. Hello there everyone, and welcome to part 14 of this series looking at the history and impact of Doctor Who viewing figures. If you're joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. We hope you stick around for future instalments and check out our previous episodes. We've covered the first three Doctor's eras, and we're now well into the reign of the fourth Doctor. But for now, sit back, relax, and join me once again as we delve back into the wonderfully niche world of Doctor Who viewing figures. Our destination? Season 14. By the summer of 1976, Doctor Who was arguably at a new peak in its popularity. Season 13 had continued to build on the high figures of Tom Baker's debut as the fourth Doctor, and with stories averaging over 10 or even 11 million viewers, it was hard to dispute the fact that as a television program, Doctor Who was working, and working to an extraordinarily high level. With the stories, the quality was consistent, and for the most part, excellent, with stories like Pyramids of Mars, The Brain of Morbius, and The Seeds of Doom being up there with some of the most celebrated Doctor Who stories ever. This level of success hadn't been there since the early days of the show in the 1960s, and what I would argue is more impressive this time around is that in Season 13's case, they didn't need the Daleks to help bring in viewers. The Pepper Pots were still popular, no doubt, but they were often chided for being a sole factor in the show's success. And with producer Philip Hinchcliffe and script editor Robert Holmes leading the charge, they were determined to prove those naysayers wrong. And prove them wrong they did. But with Season 14 approaching, the question as always was the following. Could Doctor Who continue to pull the huge numbers it had been doing over the previous two years, or was this streak of popularity going to finally crash out and burn away? Well, there's certainly a great deal of change in this season, and it certainly had consequences for the programme both good and bad. So let's dive in and see how all of this impacted the viewing figures. The first story from season 14 is The Mask of Mandragora. After being pulled into the Mandragora helix, the TARDIS arrives in 15th century Italy at the height of the Renaissance. Against a backdrop of palace intrigue and murder, the Doctor must battle to stop the Helix from gaining a foothold on Earth. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 4th of September 1976 and concluded on the 25th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and these are the nice healthy numbers you'd be hoping for to kick off a brand new season. More viewers came flooding in as the story progressed, culminating with part four soaring into double digits, pulling in 10.6 million. And even with part 1's 8.3 showing, that's hardly a sign of a bad start. Another sign of a strong opening for Doctor Who came via the Top 40 TV programs chart. All four parts did chart, and part 2 placed the highest at 22nd. Not bad for a near 13 year old program. So with all the signs pointing to success, how did the Mask of Mandragora manage to get season 14 off to a roaring start? As always, one of the first factors we must look into is promotion, and it's fair to say that the Mask of Mandragora got a pretty decent amount of it. Aside from the regular listings, Doctor Who was heavily promoted in the Radio Times as being part of BBC One's prestigious Saturday Night lineup for the autumn season. Being part of said lineup allowed this story to be briefly featured in the season lineup trailer that was broadcast frequently on BBC One. The Mask of Mandragora also received its own dedicated trailer, which was transmitted on the morning of Part One's airing. I think it's fair to say that after the massive rating success of the last few years, the BBC were taking Doctor Who very seriously and were determined to give it the best possible start for its new season. But what about the other main factor we look at, competition? Did anything on the ITV network manage to bring a serious threat to Doctor Who? Well, there were certainly plenty of different programmes across each different region, but it seems none of them really could dent the Time Lord that much. Aside from the standard fare of reruns or old movies, The Mask of Mandragora faced off against programmes such as talent show, New Faces, sci-fi drama, Space 1999, and in the first week, a musical special, Guys and Dolls. So with competition proving to be less than effective, it seems the emphasis on promotion was the real boost The Mask of Mandragora needed. With the story itself, it's not necessarily one of my favourites, I actually find it to be one of the weaker adventures of season 14. But it's the first period piece we've seen on Doctor Who in quite a while, which aren't always to my liking, but I can't deny that the set and costume work to match the period is absolutely gorgeous. Tom Baker and Elizabeth Sladen continue to be on top form as well, their character chemistry riding as high as it ever did, and they often shine in what I would argue in some cases are some quite dull scenes. One major highlight though is the introduction of the TARDIS's second control room, a wood-panelled, more Victorian-esque central hub, one which is combined with the futuristic technology that we've come to expect from the Doctor's time machine. 
I think this new control room suits Tom Baker's Doctor to a T, and thankfully, it wouldn't be the last we'd see of it. Overall, this story attracted an average of 9.5 million viewers. This figure is a big 2 million increase from the last season opener, Terror of the Zygons, showing that unlike last time, where audiences either weren't aware the show was returning so soon, or were lured away by the then brand new Space 1999, this time around, the public knew Doctor Who was on the horizon, and they weren't going to miss it. If you like more historical, period-based adventures, then The Mask of Mandragora will certainly scratch that itch for you. To experience it today, you can read the Target book from 1977, or its audio adaptation from 2009. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1991, or a standalone DVD release from 2010. This story is also available on Blu-ray, as part of the Season 14 collection set. It may not be one of my favourites, but I know many fans consider it to be an underrated gem. It's one of those cases where many other stories in Season 14 get a lot more attention and praise, so I can totally understand that view, and I'd go back and watch it again if you can. Give it that second chance. It has great looking visuals, some really interesting ideas, some truly funny dialogue, and a pair of lead actors at the height of their performances. A historical romp with a sprinkle of sci-fi? Oh, go on then. I wouldn't even say no to a salami sandwich. The second story from season 14 is The Hand of Fear. After being caught in a blast, Sarah is found clutching a fossilised hand, the remains of the Castrian Eldrad. As Sarah falls under the Castrian's malign influence, the Doctor battles to stop her from regenerating the ruthless life form. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 2nd of October 1976 and concluded on the 23rd of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and this is certainly a massive jump up. Not only do all four parts soar over 10 million, but two of them even go one step further. Part 3 brought in 11.1 million, and Part 4 saw the story peak, with 12 million viewers tuning in. With numbers like these, it should come as no surprise that all four parts charted nice and comfortably within the top 40 programs chart, with Part 4 breaking the top 20, finishing at 19th place. Well then, with some wonderfully high viewing figures across the story's four weeks of transmission, how did The Hand of Fear manage to bring in this many audience members? Well, if you think The Mask of Mandragora got good promotion, The Hand of Fear received just as much, if not more of it. The main reason being the imminent departure of companion Sarah Jane Smith, played by the wonderful Elizabeth Sladen. Sarah Jane had grown to become one of the best-loved companions in the show's history. She'd had a great start with John Pertwee's third Doctor, but it was with the fourth Doctor and their strong friendship that really cemented the character into viewers' hearts. Her departure, after nearly three years on the programme, was bound to raise the interest of any viewer who had tuned in across the past few seasons. Several articles in various newspapers covered this departure too, with Elizabeth Sladen giving many an interview. But it wasn't just the written medium that offered the Hand of Fear such promotion for this exit. Television also played its part in hyping up the moment, and by extension the story as a whole. Tom Baker and Elizabeth Sladen were the star guests on a brand new Saturday morning children's show, Multicoloured Swap Shop, hosted by the ever-recognisable Noel Edmonds. Swap Shop would go on to become one of the most iconic children's shows of the era, and with Doctor Who having such a strong popularity with younger audiences, to get the stars of the show on seemed like a match made in heaven. In regards to competition, ITV were once again offering a variety of different programmes depending on the region that you lived in. Many of these were the same programmes that faced off against The Mask of Mandragora, and even fresher competition in the form of shows like US sitcom Happy Days or quiz show Celebrity Squares couldn't quite steal away the limelight from Doctor Who. The Hand of Fear is a rip-roaring four-part adventure, and quite rightly features Sarah Jane very prominently in the centre of the action. Elizabeth Sladen gives a great performance as always, even when she's possessed by the powerful Eldrad. Speaking of Eldrad, whether in male or female form, the costume and makeup work is nothing short of excellent, one of the best creature designs in all of Classic Who. But whilst this story has many a strong moment, the key scene everyone remembers is the final one, in which the Doctor and Sarah, after being the best of friends for so long, finally have to part ways. For today's TV standards, this exit may come across as somewhat subdued or low-key, but remember, things were very different back in the 1970s. Having said that though, I think this is still a very powerful and emotional scene, and certainly one of the most memorable departures from the classic series. Even though myself and many others will gush over this scene, don't overlook the other 90% of the story. It's fast-paced, action-packed, and continues to show what Doctor Who was able to achieve as a sci-fi drama in the mid-70s. Overall, this story attracted an average of 11 million viewers, 
a 1.5 increase from the previous story. It's so rare that Doctor Who averages above the 10 million mark, and for the Tom Baker era to do so, so consistently, it's honestly quite incredible. What's heartwarming though is that 11 million people on average tuned in to see Sarah Jane's final story, which is something that Elizabeth Sladen certainly deserved. After leaving Doctor Who, Elizabeth would continue to work consistently in the industry. She never turned her back on the program either, returning first in 1981 to co-helm a brand new spin-off, Canine and Company. Now, this program has a mixed reception to say the least, but what you can't take away from it is that it was the first official Doctor Who spin-off on TV, and without it, you arguably wouldn't have had Torchwood, or Class, or even the Sarah Jane Adventures. That's right, the Doctor's best friend got her very own spin-off series. After successfully being reintroduced to a whole new generation in 2006's school reunion, Sarah Jane returned to lead a brand new CBBC show. Accompanied by a plucky gang of youngsters, Sarah Jane's further adventures would go on to be beloved by an entire generation, many of whom still look back on it now with happy memories. The Sarah Jane adventures would even see Elizabeth reunite with two different Doctors, once more with 10th Doctor David Tennant, and then with the 11th Doctor, Matt Smith. However, partway through filming the fifth series of her spin-off, all was sadly not well. Elizabeth had been struggling with her health for some time, having been diagnosed with cancer in February of 2011. Two months later, on the 19th of April, she passed away. Her passing was reported on the national TV news and featured on the front page of many newspapers. We were all heartbroken, a woman whom we had all grown to love. Whether you had first met her in the early 70s or had a fresh introduction to her in the mid-2000s, I don't know a soul around who didn't find some warmth, some love, in Sarah Jane Smith. The impact and memory she left with so many of us is still clear for all to see. Poor us. Poor us. Elizabeth Sladen will not only be remembered for her most iconic character, but for being a down-to-earth, kind-hearted, and very wonderful woman. She was 65 years old. The Hand of Fear, I would argue, is not only one of the gems of the Tom Baker era, but one of the great achievements in Elizabeth Sladen's long and successful career. To enjoy this story today, you can read the Target book from 1979, or its audio adaptation from 2021. To watch it, you have the slightly hard to find VHS release from 1996, or a more readily available DVD, which arrived in 2006. Like all stories in season 14, the Hand of Fear is also available to watch on Blu-ray, with its corresponding collection box set. Like many a Who story, The Hand of Fear does have its critics, but I think it's fair to say that this story does exactly what it needs to, and it does it well. It provides a strong, action-heavy tale, tightly paced and full of memorable moments. It allows the characters, the leads in particular, to really shine through. And shine through they do. And perhaps, most importantly, it provides a worthy and satisfying exit for the Doctor's best friend. Check it out if you haven't already. It's definitely one you won't want to miss. Travel does broaden the mind. Yes. Till we meet again, Sarah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the third story from season 14 is The Deadly Assassin. Summoned back to his homeworld of Gallifrey, the Doctor is framed for the assassination of the outgoing Time Lord President. Delaying his execution on a technicality, the Doctor has only a short time to prove his innocence and expose the sinister plans of an old enemy. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 30th of October 1976 and concluded on the 20th of November. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and those high numbers from The Hand of Fear certainly weren't going away. Every episode pulled in more than 11 million viewers, with part three taking things to grander heights and drawing in a massive 13 million, a feat the program rarely achieved for an individual episode. Doctor Who was on top of the TV world, and these numbers back that claim up immensely. All four parts cracked the top 20 of the program's chart, with part two placing highest at 11th place. Well now, after the emotional departure of Sarah Jane, how on earth did the Deadly Assassin manage to keep audience levels so high? To start with, the competition arguably sank to new lows during this story's transmission. Many regions opted for old adventure films, and in terms of new programming, Happy Days ran in London, Lucky Fella on the Southern Network, and in Yorkshire, The Adventurer was chosen to try and steal some of Doctor Who's ratings. Unfortunately for the other side, none of these offerings seemed to do the trick, for the Time Lord was becoming quite unstoppable in the ratings field. For promotion, there was tons for this story, both good and bad. 
The BBC went to great lengths to promote the return of the Doctor's deadliest enemy, the Master, who hadn't been seen on screens for over three years. In The Deadly Assassin, the character would be played by Peter Pratt, who wouldn't actually be properly seen due to the Master's decaying body being depicted via heavy costume and mask work. The other aspect in which this story got promoted was due to it being set on the Doctor's homeworld of Gallifrey. It may not sound like much of a big deal now, but back in 1976, viewers still knew very little about the planet of the Time Lords, having only sneak peeks at numerous points over the past few years. For a story to be completely set on Gallifrey, and to begin to explore many of its fundamental concepts that we know today, that must have seemed groundbreaking for fans at the time. But despite all this positive buzz of promotion from the BBC, there was also some negative press that arose during the Deadly Assassin's transmission. The National Viewers and Listeners Association, or Navala for short, was hot on Doctor Who's heels once again. Mary Whitehouse, the most vocal activist against the programme, spoke up, appealing to senior members of the BBC, insisting the show had finally gone too far. Whitehouse and Navala had previously complained about the violence and general content in Doctor Who for the past few years, with little to no real impact being dealt onto the show, aside from, say, a shift to a slightly later time slot. However, this time, Whitehouse would triumph. The scene she brought up in question was the cliffhanger to Part 3, in which Chancellor Goth is seen attempting to drown the Doctor, the final shot being a freeze frame of Baker's head under the water, with no air bubbles shown, implying that the character was in fact, dead. Whitehouse explained that this unresolved conclusion would leave younger viewers distressed and upset. Her words were heeded by BBC Director General, Sir Charles Curran, who apologised for said offending material. The consequences from this complaint were numerous. Firstly, the offending scene was erased from the master tape of the programme, only surviving today thanks to an American recording from a US broadcast. Secondly, BBC drama would now begin to approach a change in style for Doctor Who, moving away from the more gothic, eerie violent stories of the past few years to a tone that could still be frightening, but with a dash more humour and whimsy. We'll come to see these changes in full effect over the next few seasons. But with The Deadly Assassin itself, it's iconic for many different factors. As mentioned, the focus on Gallifrey and Time Lord society really gave us an insight into the Doctor's homeworld. Furthermore, this story is notable for being the only story in the classic series where the Doctor does not travel with a companion. The Master returns in full charred glory and is just as menacing and malevolent as ever. And considering the shoes Peter Pratt had to fill, left by the wonderful Roger Delgado, I think he does a pretty fantastic job. But the main highlight for me are the scenes set inside the Time Lord databank, The Matrix. This insane, no-holds-barred world is brimming with imaginative thoughts and concepts. Things happen at random, figures and scenarios keep changing every few seconds, no wonder the ratings were as high as they are. For the idea of The Matrix, it makes for fantastic viewing. It's arguably my favourite story of the Fourth Doctor's entire era, and one i definitely recommend you to watch if you haven't seen it before. It established many concepts that would last throughout the show's history, and it's a damn good story to boot. Overall, this story attracted an average of 12.2 million viewers, a 1.2 increase from the previous story. The fact that the viewing figures were jumping up so high with each story pretty much strengthens the notion that Doctor Who was certainly in some sort of golden age. We also have some repeat data for you. The Deadly Assassin was chosen to air over four consecutive Thursdays in the August of 1977. Airing from the 4th to the 25th of August, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 3.6 million viewers. Now, of course, these are wildly lower numbers than the story attained on its first broadcast, but there's two major reasons for this. One being that going out in August, audience members were down across all programs on all channels, the hot weather of summer keeping people out and about, rather than lodged in at home as they would do in the winter season. Second of all, the competition against this repeat was quite strong, with many regions airing popular soap opera Crossroads, which easily won against Doctor Who in the ratings battle. The Deadly Assassin, in my opinion, is the true definition of a Doctor Who classic, and if you wish to enjoy said classic today, you can read the Target book from 1977 or its audio adaptation from 2015. To watch it, you have two different VHS releases. The first as a standalone title in 1991, the second as part of a limited edition Time Lord collection, which hit WH Smith's exclusively in 2002. It's also available on DVD, via a standalone release from 2009 or on the Blu-ray format as part of the Season 14 collection set. Whether you're in it for a brilliant script and story penned by the masterful Robert Holmes, or the exploration of Gallifrey and its central concepts and customs, the return of the Master, or even just to see the Doctor travelling solo, I would argue the Deadly Assassin will intrigue any viewer in some capacity. 
It's one of my favourite classic Who stories, and one that certainly, in my view, deserves all the praise and respect that it gets. Finished. You're finished. The fourth story from season 14 is The Face of Evil. When the Doctor lands on an alien world, he's surprised to find that the local inhabitants both recognise and fear him. As he investigates, assisted by his new friend Leela, he discovers that a mistake in the past has had grave consequences. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 1st of January 1977 and concluded on the 22nd of the same month. You'll notice quite a gap in transmission dates between this story and the last, and we'll come to the details of that gap in a moment. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and whilst not as high as The Deadly Assassin, you can hardly complain at these numbers. All four parts still brought in over 10 million viewers, a strong achievement for any programme of the day, and part four saw the story's peak, with 11.7 million households tuning in. For the programme's chart, all parts settled into the top 20 except part one, which placed 23rd. Parts two and four drawing for peak position, both of which finished at 19th. So even though these viewing figures are still very good, what happened with the face of evil to see numbers drop from before? Well, remember how a moment ago I mentioned that there was a gap in transmission dates? I would argue that probably had something to do with the slight ratings drop. After The Deadly Assassin concluded on the 20th of November, the next two Saturdays would see compilation repeats of Doctor Who hit the airwaves. The 27th of November saw the phenomenally successful repeat of The Pyramids of Mars, which drew in the series' highest viewing figure at that point at 13.7 million. The following week, on the 4th of December, The Brain of Morbius pulled in another strong showing, with 10.9 million tuning in. The Seeds of Doom was then considered to be repeated in a compilation form the next week, on the 11th of December, but this was then replaced with Jerry Anderson's film Into Infinity. So, not including the repeats, this was the longest mid-season break Doctor Who had endured so far, with six weeks passing without a new episode. I would argue it's reasonable to assume that with this break, some viewers may not have been as alert to the show coming back. After all, you were either scanning the Radio Times each week, or you were looking for a promotional trailer on BBC One. However, the build-up to The Face of Evil was once again highlighted consistently in the media, focusing primarily on the arrival of new companion, Leela, a warrior of the Sever team, played by Louise Jameson. Several interviews were featured with the new lead, and she and Tom Baker appeared on various television programmes of the day to further promote her debut, and the return of the series itself on New Year's Day. Competition during The Face of Evil's broadcast was relatively weak. Now going out at a slightly later time of 6.20pm, most ITV regions were deciding to air lighter programmes, such as quiz show Celebrity Squares and long-standing talent show New Faces. And whilst the popularity of these programmes cannot be shrugged off, they were hardly doing major damage to Doctor Who. Not when numbers continue to grow and surpass 11 million with each passing week. And indeed, the rising numbers with each episode arguably shows that this new companion was in some way clicking with audiences, and beginning to fill the major shoes left by her incredibly popular predecessor, Sarah Jane Smith. And yes, I know her costume was partly chosen for the dads, as it were, and her use of a knife certainly irked Mary Whitehouse, who was continually watching Doctor Who with an eagle eye, but in retrospect, I would argue it's Leela's character that made her the most endearing to the viewers who tuned in. For her debut, The Face of Evil is, I find, an often overlooked adventure. Leela's introduction to the Doctor and the customs of her Seventeen tribe are wonderfully handled. The revelations concerning the Doctor's involvement are so engaging, and the story overall has had some wonderful standout moments. It may not be everyone's favourite from Season 14, but I would argue it's one that certainly still deserves your time and attention. For the very least, it gave us a new friend for the Doctor, one who had an interesting character and would go on to be loved and respected in generations to come. Overall, this story attracted an average of 11.2 million viewers, a 1 million drop from the previous story. And that may seem like a bit of a sharp drop, but an average of over 11 million in 1977 is hardly a sign of a failure. Doctor Who came back from a six-week break and still was managing to bring in numbers that echoed the early successes of the 60s and indeed carrying on the success achieved in Tom Baker's run so far. The introduction of a new companion, a later time slot, and a Christmas break clearly couldn't break the stride that Doctor Who had been riding on for the past few years. By this point, its status as a national British institution was undisputed. If you wish to revisit The Face of Evil today, you can read the Target book from 1978, but there's no audio adaptation yet at the time of this recording. To watch it, however, you have the VHS release from 1999 or a DVD release from 2012. And let's not forget you can enjoy The Face of Evil on Blu-ray, 
thanks to the Season 14 collection set released in 2020. I know many fans view several stories from the Tom Baker era as near masterpieces, and when this story is sandwiched between two of them, I can understand why it often doesn't get many reappraisals. But go back and give The Face of Evil another look. I know I enjoyed it considerably more when I did. With a fast-paced story, some great character work and some notable effects for the time, it's one that just fits as well in Season 14 as all the other tales we've looked at so far do. The fifth and penultimate story from Season 14 is The Robots of Death. The TARDIS lands inside a vast sand miner, where the privileged crew is attended by the servile robots. Accused of murder, the Doctor and Leela discover that the real culprit may not be human. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 29th of January 1977 and concluded on the 19th of February. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and would you believe it, the numbers only keep going up. All four parts exceed 12 million viewers, an insane accomplishment in itself, but part three just pushes one step further, finishing with 13.1 million tuning in. If anyone had dropped off during the Christmas break, they were well and truly back for more now. All four parts settled into the top 20 programs for their respective weeks, part one coming out on top, finishing at 14th place. So with these immensely high viewing figures only pushing further upwards, how did the Robots of Death manage to pull it off? The promotional arm for this story was just as strong as it had been for the previous adventures. Louise Jameson was still receiving a lot of coverage for playing Leela, even appearing on the Multicolored Swap Shop on the morning of Part 3's broadcast. They say any press is good press, and that certainly seems to have been the case here. Some parents were still writing into the BBC, claiming that Doctor Who had now become too frightening for their young children. It was a line that members of the production team had now become accustomed to, and they did their utmost to justify the show and its content. To say that these negative articles could have spurred some people to tune in and see what all the fuss was about, I would argue that's quite reasonable. For the competition, it was relatively the same as what had gone up against the face of evil. Celebrity squares, new faces, and also the new edition of Larry Grayson, who was airing in the London region. But with Doctor Who consistently gaining millions of viewers with each story, the popularity of such competition hardly mattered much. The show was borderline unstoppable, and despite the criticisms from some concerned parents, the show was continuing to resonate more and more with a wider audience, children and adults alike. It's easy to understand why, too. When you sit down to watch The Robots of Death, right from the word go you're introduced to this alien world, life aboard the sand miner, and the characters that inhabit it, all of whom deliver excellent performances. The titular robots themselves are iconic in terms of their design, but also in their menace. Their calm demeanour instantly turning sinister when you see those eyes glowing red. It's a wonderful story through and through, and will have you gripped and entertained from start to finish. Overall, this story attracted an average of 12.7 million viewers, a 1.5 increase from the previous story. So not only did the Robots of Death gain back the viewers lost over Christmas, but it even exceeded the Deadly Assassin's 12.2 average. In fact, this story sets a new record, now being the most viewed story on average based off first transmission and not being a repeat. That's right, after 12 seasons, the web planet has finally been dethroned. But what a worthy story to lose that crown to. We also have some repeat data for you. The Robots of Death was selected to be repeated over the New Year period, leading into 1978. This was within the mid-series gap for Season 15, and aired in two compilation episodes on Saturday the 31st of December 1977 and Sunday the 1st of January 1978. Here are the viewing figures for this repeat, and whilst they are nowhere near as strong as the story's initial transmission, they are still pretty healthy. Plus, an 8.5 million average is still very respectable and this airing helped get viewers prepared for Season 15 to continue the following Saturday. The Robots of Death stands up as one of Doctor Who's greatest stories, not just of the Tom Baker era, not even of just the classic series, but of all the programmes near 60-year history. Its writing is tight and sharp, its characters are memorable and likeable, the seemingly helpful robots make for suspenseful villains, and it's one of those stories that despite its age, it continues to hold up in almost every category. If you wish to enjoy The Robots of Death today, you can read the Target book from 1979, or its audio adaptation from 2018. There are many ways to watch the story. You can as a compilation edit, thanks to a 1986 VHS release, which was reissued in 1988. Or, in its original four-episode form, thanks to a revised release in 1995. On DVD, we also have multiple different versions. 
It was one of the first Doctor Who stories to grace the format, with its original release in 2000. However, it was included as part of the Revisitations 3 box set from 2012, as a two-disc special edition release. It's also available as part of the Season 14 collection set, exclusively on the Blu-ray format. Whilst the Tom Baker years aren't my favourite era of Doctor Who, there are some stories within it which I do recognise and appreciate their classic status, and The Robots of Death is certainly one of those adventures. It's readily available to view today, and I highly recommend that if you haven't already, that you go and experience this story for yourself. But perhaps, maybe stay away if you start showing any signs of robophobia. Would you like a jelly baby? SHUT UP! Well, a simple no thank you would have been sufficient. The sixth and final story from season 14 is The Talons of Wang Chiang. In Victorian London, young women are disappearing and something monstrous lurks in the sewers. The Doctor and Leela join forces with pathologist Professor Lightfoot and theatre impresario Henry Gordon Jago to foil the schemes of an ancient Chinese god. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 26th of February 1977 and concluded on the 2nd of April. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and we can see there's quite a drop that happened over the course of the story. Parts 2 and 6 fall below 10 million, but still within the 9 million range, which is hardly a disaster. Parts 1 and 4 stay above 11 million, with part 4 in particular gaining the story's peak viewing audience at 11.4 million. But despite these lower numbers compared to the last few stories, all six parts charted within the top 40 programs, with part 1 placing the highest at 16th place. So, after a stellar run of viewing figures achieved in Season 14 so far, what exactly happened with the talons of Wen Chiang that caused the numbers to drop so sharply? The competition was relatively the same once again, celebrity squares and new faces being the strongest opponents, and they could have arguably taken some viewership away from Doctor Who, but considering they lost out to the previous two adventures, it seems odd that all of a sudden millions would decide to dive away to these lighter programs. For promotion, Doctor Who was still a regular presence with the print world, Promotional appearances on TV and radio kept the show firmly in the public eye, and the announcement of producer Philip Hinchcliffe and script editor Robert Holmes' departure from the series was discussed. These two had been essential for once again revitalising Doctor Who for the first three years of Tom Baker's reign, and it had proven to be a roaring success. However, despite said success, the comments of the show being too scary for children were still present, with Robert Holmes stressing that the programme was no longer for children. And when you watch The Talons of Wang Chiang, you can kind of understand what he means. It's certainly an atmospheric story, the period London streets and settings looking rather striking. The moments of horror are great too, featuring giant rats amongst other things, which certainly got Navala and concerned parents riled up. The guest stars are a joy too, particularly Henry Gordon Jago and Professor Lightfoot, played by Christopher Benjamin and Trevor Baxter respectively. These two characters are wonderfully entertaining, so much so that despite only appearing in one TV story, they would go on to have several, and I mean several, series with Big Finish, who produce audio dramas, many of which centred around the universe of Doctor Who. Robert Holmes' script is once again brimming with great dialogue, and many great action pieces that either provoke tension, suspense, or exhilaration, and it arguably stands as one of his finest scripts for the programme. Now, I know there are some elements of talents that are extremely controversial, not least the fact Lee Sen Chang is played by a white actor, adopting what is known as Yellowface. It's uncomfortable on repeat viewings, and I've always found it disgraceful that the BBC didn't employ an Asian actor for this role, especially when there are other Asian actors featured throughout the story. Keep that in mind if you're watching this for the first time. It's a practice that was wrong then, and indeed is now, and if anything, it serves as a part of history, to hopefully show and educate people as to why this kind of practice has no place in the media industry. Overall, this story attracted an average of 10.4 million viewers, a massive 2.3 million drop from the previous story. And whilst this drop may seem a lot more significant than other drops we've seen in the season, just have another look at that average. To average at over 10 million viewers for a six-part story in 1977, a time when Doctor Who was only doing six-part stories once a year, is remarkable. And even though it comes out as one of the lowest averages of season 14, it's clear enough that the style and tone of Doctor Who was keeping the audience hooked in their millions. Despite its controversies, I would argue that The Talons of Wang Chiang is still a very enjoyable story on the whole to watch. It's the culmination of everything Philip Hinchcliffe and Robert Holmes were trying to achieve with their time on the show. To make it more frightening, to make it more exciting, and also to make it even more fun than it already was. And I would argue that for the most part, both with this story and over the past three years, they succeeded. To delve into The Talons of Wang Chiang today, 
You can read the Target book from 1977, or its audio adaptation from 2013. To watch it, you have a VHS release from 1988, which presents the story in a compilation format. Oddly though, it was never released in its original six episode structure on VHS. It was released in the episodic form on DVD, however, first as a standalone release in 2003, and then again as a special edition in 2010, making up part of the Revisitations 1 box set. Talons is also available to view on Blu-ray, thanks to the Season 14 collection set. It's a favourite to many a fan, and some even crown it as the definitive story in Tom Baker's long, distinguished reign as the Fourth Doctor. I wouldn't say that myself, but it's certainly one of the strongest six-part stories of the day, and has enough imagination, horror and fun within it to keep me and many others coming back to watch it again and again. I say, I say, I say! Oh, oh, oh. A funny thing happened to me. Has she got the gun? Hey! Who are you shooting at? So that's season 14, the six stories that comprise it, and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of episode 6 of The Talons of Wang Chiang, season 14 was brought to an end, concluding a seven month run comprised of 26 episodes across six stories. Now let's have a look at the story averages for this season, and this certainly is one of the strongest runs we've had on our journey so far. Every story bar the season opener averaged at over 10 million viewers, an incredible achievement for any long running program. The peak comes with The Robots of Death, which attained a 12.7 million average, now becoming as mentioned, the most viewed Doctor Who story on average, based on first broadcast. Now, as we always do, Let's work out the overall average for this season. By combining the average ratings of each story, we can calculate that the average for season 14 of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 11.2 million viewers. That's a massive 1.1 increase from the averages of seasons 12 and 13, and now actually takes the top spot as being the most watched season of the show on our journey thus far, dethroning season 2's total of 10.4 million. So season 14 has actually set two records, gaining the new most viewed individual story title and also most viewed season on average as well. Like season 13 before it, many fans considered this run of stories to be part of Doctor Who's golden age, a time where audiences were tuning in in their millions and the quality of the stories was unparalleled. With the numbers we've seen achieved in season 14, it's hard to denounce that theory. Certainly, it's provided us with some of the strongest viewing figures we've seen thus far. Audiences got to see the departure of Sarah Jane, the return of the Master, the arrival of Leela, and see the Doctor face off against the rebellious robots the illustrious Eldrad, and in some ways, even himself. It's a jam-packed season to say the least, and a lot of that again has to be put down to Philip Hinchcliffe and Robert Holmes, whose partnership and focus on these kinds of stories helped propel the show to heights it could have never have dreamed of. But after season 14 concluded, their time was up, and their replacements would take the helm in mere months. And after the colossal success achieved by season 14, could the following season, season 15, even dream to live up to those stratospheric heights? You'll have to tune in next time to find out. So those are the ratings details for Season 14. I hope you enjoyed this numerical look back at a run of stories that many would claim to be the peak of all who in terms of quality. And whether you agree with that statement or not, I think we can all agree that for the most part, this season certainly wasn't short on quality stories. If you want to see more wonderful Who content, then I highly recommend that you check out Christopher and Lewis over at Doctor Who Adventures. These two have a great visual style to their channel and make great entertaining videos to boot. If you want to read more about Doctor Who and the making of it, I highly recommend the Complete History series of books, which I used as reference for this video. If you want to keep up to date with this series, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to see new episodes of the series early, then you can by supporting us on Patreon or via my Ko-fi page. Please consider leaving a like, subscribing to the channel, and leaving your thoughts on Season 14 in the comments section below. I've been Adam Martin from AMTV, and we will see you next time for Season 15.